It's good to see everybody here tonight. Let's stand together as we sing. Got to find my music. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hands He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hands He leadeth me. Sometimes with scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's powers bloom, by waters calm or troubled sea, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hands he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hands he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content, whatever lot I see, since is my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, leadeth me by his own hand. He leadeth me, his faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold waves I would not flee, since thou through Jordan leadest me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hands he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hands he leadeth me. Oh, oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shed us to spelling with joy, I'm telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my mind was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. 
justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe Riches eternal and blessings eternal From His precious hand I receive Heaven came down in glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me whole washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul you may be seated as we continue to say God sent his son they call him Jesus he came to love Heal and forgive, he bled and died to buy my pardon. And at the grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and the life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold. A newborn baby, and feel the pride and the joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because Christ lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just. Because he lives, and then one day, I'll cross that river, I'll find life's line, no war with pain, and then I'll step, gives way to victory. I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He reigns. Because He lives, 
I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know I know He holds the future and life is worth the living just because He lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, I know He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. Amen. Let's pray for our time of offering. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that because you live, we one day will live with you those of us that have called on your name as Lord and Savior. Lord, we just pray that you will continue to be with the remainder of our service, be with Brother David as he brings the words you've laid on his heart. Lord, the offering that we take, Lord, let it further your kingdom here on this earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, if you turn to 2 Samuel 15. <clears throat> 2 Samuel 15. We're going to be looking at this passage tonight. <clears throat> Been having some problems with my throat today, so I don't know if I'm going to make it through this tonight or not. We'll pray that the Lord helps me, okay? <clears throat> Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of friends tonight. And friendship is a very special relationship between two people. 
And I've heard people say it before that if you have two or three really close friends uh, in your entire life, that's a pretty amazing thing. To have two or three real, true, close, intimate friends. A friend is truly priceless. One poet described friendship as a sheltering tree. I like that. That's a great way <clears throat> to describe friends. They're like a great oak tree spreading out their branches, providing protection from the elements and shade. And When we're lonely, they're there to shade us. When the storms of sorrow and pain beat down upon us, they stand close by to help. You know, I think we're taught in our society <clears throat> so many times that we don't need anybody. That if you need somebody, you're weak. That we should be able to stand on our own two feet and how false that teaching is. I think about the Lord Jesus who had <clears throat> many friends around him during his earthly life. Jesus had three very intimate friends, Peter, James, and John. They were intimate, close, and if friends is a sign of weakness, then why did Jesus have so many? Because he wasn't weak. It's not a sign of weakness to have a friend or need a friend. We need friends. And they're a sheltering tree. And so I want to ask you tonight to think about in your life, how many friends do you have? I mean the kind that provides shelter for you in the time of need. One that you can share your deepest hurts, your fears, your struggles. Somebody that you can turn to and share with without them looking down upon you or you being afraid to share with them. One who will stand with you when things get tough and it's difficult to stand with you, but they'll stand. And so with those thoughts in mind, we continue this series on the life of David. And at this point in David's life, we find a man who not only had one or two sheltering trees, but he had a whole grove. And we need to see in David's life friends and the importance of friendship. But I want to review a little bit. And I want to remind ourselves where David is in his life right now. First... Personally, David was a wash in guilt. <clears throat> David had committed his great sin with Bathsheba, and they then murdered her husband, and then he lived for month, months in, in secrecy, in secret sin, living a life of hypocrisy. And there were many consequences of David's sin. He lost his child, his baby, and was watching his whole world fall apart. David was eat up with guilt. And so he was awash in guilt at this point in his life. Number two, David domestically, his home was in ruins. We saw several weeks ago what was going on in the royal palace. There's angerness, there's bitterness, there's incest, there's rape, there's murder, there's rebellion. And all that stuff was taking place between David's children. All of that garbage. Talk about family trouble. And not only that, but we have Solomon, Absalom, leading a conspiracy against him to take over the throne. So domestically, David's home was in shambles. Number three, politically, David had lost his respect and authority as a leader. David had not only lost touch with his family, but he had a growing number of critics in the country, and they realized that their king had clay feet. And so David had lost that respect and authority. So here David is. Now think about this. Personally, domestically, and politically, David has troubles. He's hurting. And we read that his son Absalom, a conspiracy begins to bloom. So let's look and let's read uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> 
after this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was when everyone, anyone, where whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, "What city are you from?" And they would say, "Your servant is from such and such, a tribe of Israel." Then Absalom would say to him, "Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you." Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who had any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. Now, let me tell you what's going on here. Absalom is running for political office. That's exactly what he's doing. His technique is based on lies and treachery. His father is the king. And he's down there at the gate where the people come to settle their complaints, to seek the counsel of the king. And it was there where Absalom awaits to intercept with lies. He was saying something like this. Hey, you know, nobody up there in the royal palace, they don't give a rip about you. They don't care about what you say and what kind of problems you're going through. But I do. I care. I'll listen. Oh, that someone would see the value of my wisdom and let me take the throne. And you know what? If you'd let me take the throne, I'd show y'all what justice truly looks like. Now, this is Absalom, David's son. Look at verse 5 and 6. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So the plan worked perfectly. Little by little, person by person, he undermined his father's reputation and built his own until he's ready to make his big move. Now look at verse 7 through 10. Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Geshur in Syria, saying, if the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said, go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Verse 10, then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. So he gets in Hebron and one blast of the trumpet, and guess what? Absalom's on his way to the throne. And with a sigh, David, this good man, this man after God's own heart, is broken. Not only has his son betrayed him, but he's feeling like there's not one friend anywhere around. Look at verse 13. Now a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now get this scene in your mind. The once great King David is scrambling around in the palace, throwing a few items in a suitcase, hurrying off to flee from his very own son. Think of that. After all these years of being king, David is once again on the run, fleeing for his life. I bet he's having flashbacks of the days of Saul. Don't you know he did? He thought about the time that he was running. But think about David. All that we've talked about thus far. If a man ever needed a friend, he needs a friend. Look at verse 15 and 16. And the king's servant said to the king, We are your servants, ready to do whatever my lord the king commands. Then the king went out with all his household after him. But the king left ten women, concubines, to keep the house. You know, when I read 
verse 15 and 16, I thought, man, what emotions are there in those words? Because David was leaving the great city, Zion, named after him, the city of David. And I can just picture as he came to the edge of town, maybe at the last house, he stopped and looked over the great city that he had watched God build over those past years. And his heart must have been breaking as he looked back on the many memories that flooded his mind. And all of the people in his household hurrying by, leading animals piled high with belongings. Literally, literally, they are running for their lives. Think of that. At that moment, David needed a friend. It's amazing when the rug has been yanked out from under us and there's nobody there to affirm us. There's no crutches to lean on, no reputation to cling to. All the lights are out, the chips are down, things look grim, things look hopeless. And the majority is following someone else. It's amazing how God in His timing sends a sheltering tree our way. He sends us a friend. And he does this in David's life. And this is what I want to look at tonight because God gives David not just one friend, but five of them. And I'm sure, probably, many of you have never even heard of these people. These are some unsung heroes in the Bible. Number one, let's look at them. Ooh, I'm about to jerk off my. I did jerk it off. Number one, the first friend is. Atiyah the Gittite, Atiyah, Atiyah the Gittite. Look at verse 18 and 19. Then all his servants passed before him, all the Carathites and the Pelathites and the Gittites, 600 men who had followed him from Gath, passed before the king. Then the king said to Atiyah the Gittite, Why are you also going with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. So this is the first time the man Atiyah is mentioned in David's biography, but he's a friend of the king. He never gets in the limelight until the chips are down and David has stopped at the last house. And Listen to me. There's no more throne, no more glory, no more splendor. And all at once he comes to the surface and says, this, this friend, uh, Atiyah, the Gittite. And you know what he says? King, count me in. I'm with you all the way. And the most amazing thing about this guy, Atiyah, he's a Gittite. That's amazing. A Gittite, you know where they were from? Gath. Gath. Remember who came from Gath? Does anybody know? Who came from Gath? Goliath. He came from Gath. The great warrior giant. And if you remember back in our story, David had slipped into the, to the Philistine camp and brought some of the people into exile. And instead of hating him, they had fallen in love with David, his personality, his leadership. And so when David's back is against the wall, Atiyah says, I will stand with you by life or by death. Now let me tell you something. That, my friend, is a true friend. David tells him, take off. This is your chance. Run. Flee, man. Go back to your country. You're a foreigner. And he says, nope. I'm with you. Look at verse 20. In fact... <clears throat> Look at what it says at verse 20. In fact, you came only yesterday. Should I make you wander up and, uh, up and down with us today? Since I go back, I know not where. Return and take your brethren back. Mercy and truth be with you. That's what David said. That's what David said to Atiyah. Now notice his response in verse 21. And Atiyah answered the king and said, As the Lord lives... And as my Lord the King lives, surely in whatever place my Lord the King shall be, whether in death or life, even there also your servant will be. Now that's a true friend. Right there. He says, David, if they kill you, I'll die with you. 
If the whole world stands against you, I will stand in your defense. This guy is tough. He is made of some sturdy stuff. There's not many friends like that. So over the hill they go, leaving the great city of Zion and on their way with the king into no man's land without any promise of what the future holds. When everything else fails and everybody else is turned away, there are a few precious friends who you can call on who will say, Hey, I'm with you. I'm there. Count me in. Call on me. Day or night, I will be by your side. I understand. And the amazing thing to me is that sometimes the person who stands that near is the guy from Gath. A person who was once an enemy, but he's now a true friend. That's the first friend. Now number two, the second group of friends in David's life is Zadok and Abiathar. Zadok and Abiathar. Look at verse 23 and 24. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron. And all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. And there was Zadok and also all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God. And Abiathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. Now these two men are Levites. And they come along carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They set that heavy sacred chest down and look over at David and said, Where do we go from here? We are with you, king. We've been with you all along. These men are priests. They are representatives of God who minister in the house of God. Now look at verse 25 and 26. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, He will bring me back and show me both it and His dwelling place. But if He says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am, let Him do to me as seems good to Him. Now when I read that, I think about the humility in that. David, I mean, that's humility. He's got a humble spirit. That's how you ride out the storm of consequences. David sinned. He's blown it. He has miserably blown it. But you know what he's saying? Lord, if you choose to finish me off, I'm good with that. <laughs> I mean, that's what he's saying. But if you choose to use me further, that's wonderful too. But whatever happens in my future, it's in your hands, God. Now think about that for a minute. Through David's obedience, it reveals that he is a man after God's own heart. He knows that the ark does not belong to him. And out of sheer respect, he lays it all at the Lord's disposal. David tells his friends to take the ark back to the city. Go back, you're needed there. And out of respect, that is exactly what they did. There was no argument, no resistance, not even a discussion. They were there to help David. And if it meant going back, and that's what he wanted them to do, that's what they would do. Now look at verse 27 and 28. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimazaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So sometimes when you're really in need, you will have a few friends who will be able to say to you, Do whatever you wish, I'm available. And they are the Zadoks and the Abiathars of your life. No one will ever know about them. But they will run interference for you. And they will be down there on the front lines. It's not really pleasant there, but they're protecting you from the blast. Shielding you and protecting you just by their presence. And they might get beat up, but they stand in your corner. Listen to me, that is a true friend. Those are two guys that were friends to David. Number three, the third friend is Hushia. Hushia. Look at verse 30 and verse 32. Verse 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered and he went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. Verse 32. 
Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. There was Hushia, the archai, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. Now who is this guy? I mean, how many of you have heard of Hushia? Verse 37, so Hushia, David's friend. Did you see that? Look at verse 37. So Hushia, David's friend went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. When he met David, the man's coat was torn, his head was covered with dust. That's what people in that day did to express total bankruptcy. I mean, you know, if you was in a kind of a, a bad way, that's why Job tore his garments and threw dust on his head. It's, it's as to say, I have nothing left. I am finished. I am done. I am bankrupt. For Hushiah, these were marks of compassionate feelings for David, and David spotted it immediately. Sometime when the pain is so great, your own personal Hushiah arrives. With his presence, he wraps himself around you. That warm, speechless embrace, speechless embrace, says it all. He's there, no sermon. No great message of hope. No verse of scripture. He may not even pray. Maybe just a hug. So David gives this loyal friend, Hushia, a special task. Look at verse 34. 15, 34. <coughs> but if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Now you're probably thinking, who is this Ahithophel? Well, this guy's Absalom's counselor. He's joined himself to the band of conspirators. So David tells his friend, Hushia, you can help me the most by being my spy in Absalom's camp. You will be the supply line of communication from his headquarters. By claiming loyalty to him, you'll be on hand to find a way to turn that throne against him. So here is David, the military strategist. And even though he's in great stress and misery, he's still able to plan wisely. And what he predicted is exactly what happened. As a matter of fact, the whole line of communication was set up that led to the overthrow of Absalom. Hushia, Abiathar, and Zadok, and an unknown girl and boy who took a message, and an unnamed woman who hid two messengers. These are friends of David we never hear about because few bother to cover this part of David's life. But when the chips are down, they were there, and they were rallying again for David. True friendship. Number four, the fourth group of friends are... Shobiah, Maker, and Barzillia. Look at chapter 17. Go to 2 Samuel 17 and verse 27. Now it happened when David had come from Manam, Mahayanam that Shobiah, the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Machar, the son of Amiel, 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 that's it, Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillia the Gildite from Rogelum brought beds and basins, earthly vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain and beans, lentils, parched seed, honey and curd, sheep and cheese of the herd for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So David came to Mahanaim, Mahanaim. And if you check the scripture, you'll find that place first mentioned in Genesis 32 too. It's the name Jacob gave the place when the angel came and ministered to him. Centuries later, here he is David out in the middle of nowhere, and the angels in the form of these three men bring them all the food and supplies they need out in the wilderness. When you're hungry and you're weary and you're thirsty, that's when a friend comes through. 
You don't even have to ask. When you've got a friend like this, he knows you're hungry, he knows you're thirsty, he knows you're weary. And the beautiful thing about true friends is they don't have to be told what to do. They just do it. They don't have to be told. They just do it. Shobiah was from the sons of Ammon, and he could have said, David has fought my people, and he has been so cruel, there is no way I am even going to take a crumb of bread to him. Because David fought his people. Machir, he was the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Amiel from Lodabar. Do you remember Lodabar? Who lived in Lodabar? Mephibosheth. The handicapped son of Jonathan lived there. And when Mephibosheth had fled for his life after the death of his father Jonathan and grandfather Saul, he finally ended up in the middle of the desert, Lodabar, which means no pasture. And Machir was the man who took the crippled boy into his home. Machir was the kind of guy who took care of people who were in need. He could have said, hey, you know what? Man, I've been taking care of this handicapped kid for all these years. I've done my duty. David's going to have to take care of himself. Barzillia, if you look at the next chapter, you're going to find out that old Barzillia was 80 years old. Now, now follow me. Barzillia, he's 80. You know what he could have said? Hey, I'm retired. I'm old. I've done my service. You know what? Let some of the younger folks take David some food. But he didn't. Instead, these three unsung heroes voluntarily got their heads together, worked hard, loaded up every supply they could think of, and headed off to help David, their friend in me. What a group of unsung heroes in the Bible. No applause, no big deal, just faithful friends. All David's friends came through for him when he needed them. They had no agenda. They were there to help with his physical and emotional needs. And sometimes later, after a series of terrible events, David receives word that his rebellious son Absalom is murdered. And this happened before he had a chance to clear up some unresolved conflict between father and son. But before David could get things right with his son, before he could confess how sorry he was for being so busy and so negligent as a dad, boom, Absalom was dead. And we see the sorrow and we hear the anguish. I think it's one of the most moving verses in the Scripture in 2 Samuel 18, verse 33. Look at what it says. Then the king was deeply moved. He went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. As a parent, you can identify. Think about your child being murdered. And you hadn't really influenced them the way that you should. And... They've died, and soon after that, David needed a friend. Memories of his failed past filled his mind. Guilt assaulted him. He could not get past his grief. He was caught in the emotional grief. Sometimes grief does that to you. It's like you're in a dungeon, and somebody locks the door and, and from the outside, and you can't get out. You try your best. You might even fake it, but it's still there. But all of a sudden, a friend finds a way to climb in there with you. The fifth friend was Joab, number five, Joab. Look at 19, verse 1 and 2. 2 Samuel 19, verse 1 and 2. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people For the people heard it and said that day, the king is grieved for his son. So the people were seeing Absalom's death as God's deliverance. They were rejoicing. God took care of Absalom. Now David gets back to the throne where you belong. 
God has vindicated you. This is your chance. But David was so absorbed in his own personal grief in the dungeon where it was so dark and empty, he couldn't take that in. He was all alone, lost in the swelling tide of grief and torment. He had nobody around to say, come on, David, get back. Your leadership is needed. And that's where Joab come in. And he rather forcefully confronted David. Had he not, David would not even heard. But look at what he said, uh, 2 Samuel 19, verse 4 through 7. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life. And the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither prince nor servant. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth unto now. Now what is Joab doing? He's being a friend. He's being a true friend. He is speaking the truth in love to David. He's saying, come on, David, get on your feet. You've got to get past this grief. There are people out there who have risked their lives, their loyalty to you. They have believed in you, and they have defended you. And you have licked your wounds long enough, David. Your heart may be broken, but you're still the king of Israel, and there's a job to be done. Joab <coughs> was a friend to David. He cared enough to confront him. He cared enough to tell him the truth and prevent him from compounding the damage already been done by making even a greater mistake. We have to hand it to David here, though gripped by grief. I want you to listen to what he done in verse 8, 2 Samuel 19, 8. Look at what it says. He heeded Joab's advice. He said, Then the king arose and sat at the gate, and they told all the people, saying, There is the king. There is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for every one of Israel had fled to his tent. The gate of the city was where the king or the leader went to give an audience, to judge, to counsel, to meet with people. So when David went to the gate, you know what the people knew? He's back in leadership. Joab, sheltering friendship, like all the others who had ministered to him earlier, had lifted David out from the bottom. Now, what I want to do is I close. These are those, those are the friends, okay? Now, I just want to give you some real practical advice, some practical truth about friends as we kind of close tonight. Friendship is indeed a sheltering tree. Friendship is where you, we find the hands of God ministering and encouraging and giving support through people who are unknown heroes of the faith, like all the people we've looked at tonight. Did you know that the word friends, friendly, and friendship appears over a hundred times in Scripture? Friend, friends, or friendly, over a hundred times. God says a lot about friendship. Friendship is important. Look at these four things. Number one, friends are not optional. They are essential. Friends are not optional. They are essential. There is no substitute for a friend. Someone to care, listen, to feel, to comfort, and yes, to reprove us on occasions. True friends can do that the best. Reprove. Number two, friends are not automatic. They must be cultivated. Proverbs eighteen twenty four: A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs eighteen twenty four. I've got in here, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's another verse maybe that a man that has friends must show himself friendly. So friends are not automatic. They have to be cultivated. Number three, friends are not neutral. They impact our lives. 
If you're, listen to me, and I want you, these young people that are here tonight, you teenagers and you boys and girls that are here, I want y'all to listen to me real careful. If your friends lead a good life, a Christian life, you know what? They're going to lead you to live a Christian life and live a better life. You hear me, young people? If your friends lead bad lives, they're going to lead you down that path. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived, bad company corrupts or ruins good morals. So young people, you need to listen. You need to choose your friends wisely. Now listen to me. Gossips usually gravitate to gossips. It's amazing. Amazing. Rebels run with rebels. I've heard people say, oh, my child fell in with the wrong crowd when the bottom line is your child was the wrong crowd. You just ain't got sense enough to recognize it. Rebels run with rebels. Choose wise friends. You want to grow spiritually? Choose friends who are growing spiritually. You want to serve the Lord? Choose friends who serve the Lord. Listen to me. You listening? Isabella, are you listening? You need to choose your friends wisely. Number four, friendship comes in varying degrees. Some who play a more significant role in our lives than others. Now, I want to I talk to you about this briefly. Acquaintances are people with whom we have limited contact and superficial interaction. We just kind of skate over the surface with acquaintances, okay? Then you got casual friends, all right? These are people whom you have more contact with. We have common interests and with whom we may have a more specific conversation. And every once in a while, we might even seek the opinion of a person who is a casual friend, but there's still safe distance between us and a casual friend. And then there's close friends. These are people whom we share similar life goals and we'll discuss the hard questions. We might even serve together, socialize together, spend time together, do things together. That's a close friend. But let me talk to you about intimate friends. All right, so we talked about acquaintances, casual friends, close friends, but let me talk to you about intimate friends. That, are the, that is those few people that we talk about, those one or two that you have during your lifetime whom we have regular contact and a deep commitment. We're not only open and vulnerable with these people, we await their counsel. Intimate friends are free to criticize and correct just as much as they are to embrace and encourage because trust And mutual understanding has been developed between an intimate friend. Because I've made this statement before. If you have one or two intimate friends in your life, you've done well. And I've had people, oh, I've got bunches of friends. No, you've got acquaintances. You have casual friends. You have close friends. But what I'm asking tonight is, how many intimate friends do you have? I mean ones that you can be real and you can be open and honest and genuine. You see, we're, we're, we don't have many friends like that. All of the levels of friendship are important, but the most important is that last one, that intimate friend. Those who have no intimate friends have to be the loneliest people in the world. All of us need at least one person. You hear me? One person that we can be open and honest with. All of us need a friend who can offer us shelter and support and encouragement and yes, even speak the hard truths to us in our life. Do you have a friend like that? David had a group of friends and a very difficult time in his life and as a result, he made it through. And I want to say tonight, if you have a friend like that, You need to thank God for them, and you need to tell them that you thank God for them. I have a friend like that, and I thank God for them, and I tell them 
You don't know how much I appreciate you. You don't know how much I thank God for you in my life. If you're not, if you don't have one, get busy. Start planning a few. And you'll never be sorry for the friendship. The importance of friends is very important. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God tonight.